I guess I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and start and do the introductions. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, you know, a number of new people here. We're the Rocky Mountain Inventors Association. We're a 501c3 nonprofit educational group. Been around since 1978 in a lot of different forms, but basically trying to help people with ideas and uh, assist them in turning a product into a business. Because it's the main stumbling block people have. It's the hardest thing to do because a lot of inventors, they get a nice prototype, they might even get a patent or trademark, and then they get stuck. <laughs> uh, because you have to bring in other people, you need funding and financing, you gotta work the manufacturing and marketing, there's a lot of things going on. So we have a great speaker tonight, Jake Jabs. He was here in January 17, and uh, you know had a great reception. You think, well, what's Jake Jabs got to do with inventing? But there's plenty of things because if the inventor thinks beyond first base when they're going to build a business, you've got to hire people, you've got to manage people, you've got to market. There's so many things you've got to think of doing in turning your invention into a real business because that's where the payoff is. And like in my area for patent, trademark, and copyright, um, they don't pay off unless you make a real business. They're just a nice you know, portrait on the wall. <laughs> Anyway, um, our meeting after this, we're going to take the rest of June off. Our next meeting is the second Monday in July, and we're going to have uh, Anthony Pritchard back on social media. Uh, Bonnie Cake is coming to talk about how to do trade shows. Um, Brian Densmore is going to come talk about business valuation and how, how the buying and selling of a business process works. And John Eckstein, a securities attorney, is going to come talk about the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Jobs Act, blue sky laws in Colorado. This is how you can raise uh, equity for your business as a small business and not have to go through a regular uh, public offering. The, this is like through November. <laughs> I, yeah, and I've got a few, few open slots and everything still. So what we usually do is we do a, a round robin around the room. Everyone take about a minute. Uh, introduce yourself and uh, tell us what you've got going on. So I'll start here with Paul. We'll just pass this around. I'm Paul Moran. This is my co-worker, Carol Ann Ball. We've developed a product that put it on wood, just uh, low pressure spray on wood makes it absolutely impossible for it to burn. Uh, we're working on a, to see if it has the same effect on fabrics. The, uh, the easy part's over. Roger has his, got his a patent for it, so we're all set on that. <clears throat> now we gotta get somebody put together to put the, make this thing fly. I, every time I talk to somebody, it's, they're enthusiastic about it, as well as we are. But uh, now we've got to get somebody out there to present it to the public, and we're ready for that. And, and uh, he's got his patent tonight. He just got it. So you can show it around to everyone and show it off. <laughs> it's for a, uh, a fire retardant composition treatment for wood. My name is Jamie Lutz. This is my first meeting. I've been working on a few products kind of all over the place. and. Just thought I'd come and learn from Jake and meet everybody. So thank you. Uh, my name is Brad Granley. I'm an, an engineer by training, so I've kind of got that mindset of seeing a problem and solving it. And I guess I've been keeping little notes over the last couple decades on ideas, and it's time to just learn a little bit more on how to move those forward. So that's me. I'm Paul Williamson, and I'm just sitting in. I have an idea that I'm turning over that I hope to present here pretty soon and just want to come and see if I can uh, maybe kind of get some ideas here. Thanks, Paul. I'm Richard Hughes. I'm an attorney. I do estate planning work during the daytime, tinker with my investments at night. And over the last two or three years, I think I've spent close to what Jabs has spent on his DNA ads in the Denver Post. 
for my estate planning seminars. I don't know if you've ever seen those, Jake, but I haven't seen you show up at a seminar yet. But <laughs> yeah. I'm Gary Paulus, um, engineer by training, but uh, decided to start up a company, and I've got uh, two patents, two exercise patents. I've licensed one of them, and that's not going so well, and I'm looking to uh, finish the other one off and hopefully be able to license that in a more positive way. Hello, my name is Brian. Um, I have a few product ideas rolling around and uh, kind of explored the licensing route quite a bit and just kind of wanted to look into venturing and what all uh, entailed in that. And, yeah, just want to come here and see Jake speak and see what information I can gather um, from him. So I'm Derek Hurd. This is my first time here as well. Um, engineer, like some other folks. I guess what you would call an amateur inventor for many years, meaning I've never gotten paid for it. <laughs> so looking to maybe change that. <laughs> yeah. Looking to kind of change that and see, just learn from others and do some networking here, maybe figure out what resources are available to me. Part of our goal is to, uh, you know, we can't help you succeed all the way, but we can give you reasonable expectations and try to keep you from making bad mistakes. I'm Charles Woldridge, and uh, second time I've been here, and I really appreciate the opportunity that's been brought to all of us by having this meeting tonight. I'm a painter, sculptor, inventor. I had my first patent pending when I was 17. But it's really hard to have fantastic ideas that you're excited about and see them in fruition without being stranded at the shore of economics or, you know, self-doubt and things like that. So to see a lot of other people here tonight with hopes and dreams is just encouraging in itself. My name is James Cook. I'm a mental health nurse. Um, got an idea I'm working on. Just here to get ideas. It's not related to nursing, though, so <laughs> that's it for me. I'm Steve Patterson, and uh, I've been doing product development and ideas on my own for years, and it took me a long time to figure out that you can't invent things all by yourself. You've got to uh, get people to share the dream, and until you can get people to share the dream, your idea is going to go nowhere. And that's what I've learned, anyway. Jim Frazier, I uh, have a provisional patent on a product. I've done uh, pilot testing, it's ready to market. It's uh, sort of for brain researchers and psychologists and psychiatrists to do research on the brain and mind. And uh, it's ready to launch, it's taken four years. And uh, this is my helper, Cindy Louder. She's my counselor and uh, a person who understands the need for that type of technology. I'm Fern Roberts, and I do have a product that I invented, and but it's been a few years ago, but I haven't done anything with it, and uh, I do have a patent on it, and uh, I'm motivated now to get it out there. <laughs> and I'm trying to get a hold, or not, I haven't tried very hard to get a hold of uh, Laurie Grenier from Shark Tank, or um, the other gal, Barbara, whatever her last name is. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I just need to get the right person to help me. Uh, hopefully, maybe some of you. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Sheldon Roberts, another sculptor and been an artist all my life and paid for my life with that, but I'm taking the creativity on into inventing now and I'm just here to learn as much as I can about business. This is my wife, Megan, and she is quite the help as well. Hi, I'm Megan Roberts. I'm a massage therapist and a mom, mostly, but 
do some administrative stuff, and I love coming down here on a date with my husband to share all the creativity and get to open my mind to new possibilities. Hi guys, I'm Zeke Reardon. Um, I love inventing. I absolutely love it. I come up with ideas all the time. I have so many ideas that I don't know what to do with them. Sometimes I don't know where to focus. And so I've been working on that. 2018 has been my year of focus. Um, I have one, one idea that I'm working on uh, quite often and I'm enjoying it a lot. And Hopefully eventually I want to take it to market. It's not something I want to license, something I want to take all the way. Uh, but I'm glad just to be focusing on one thing and uh, I, I just I love this industry. I love the people that come with it. Everybody here um, in these meetings has just been incredible. And so we'll keep it going, Roger, as long as we have you to help us out. Thanks. And one more. <laughs> just uh, tell us what you've got going on. But don't reveal any secrets. Uh, sorry for showing up late. Um, my name's Tammy. Uh, I'm an, um, an inventor. This is my first time here. I created a cosmetic applicator slash tool. Uh, yeah, just here for the information and the insight. So uh, one thing, um, if you haven't been a member or paid, we uh, ask for a $10 donation just to cover costs. We get this facility for no cost, and it just goes for website, email, and food. It's just bare cost. Nobody makes a salary. So anyway. Um, Jake's asked me to go ahead and start with this video, and then he'll start with his uh, talk after that.
there you go. Okay. Am I loud enough? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, the reason uh, I wanted to show you that video, I think you can see that there's a lot of things I invented over the last 42 years of being in business. And really, that's what you need to continue to do. In fact, I wrote a news. I spoke here a year ago, January, and, and how many of you were here last time? Just, just one of you. Okay. I guess I could have gave the same speech. <laughs> <laughs> but I decided to write a separate speech for you guys this time because what's happening is you've got to reinvent, reinvent. In the retail business, guys, right now, you've got to reinvent your business, and if you're not reinventing your business today, you're probably not going to be around. Because there's hundreds and hundreds of I'm going to give you some numbers. And just So the name of my speech is today called Reinvention. And uh, as you can tell, I'm an entrepreneur. I support a lot of entrepreneurs here. So how many of you guys here, if you're an entrepreneur and an inventor, say yes. 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 You bet. Yeah. That's right. Because I think invention and entrepreneurship are really the same thing. They, aren't they kind of the same thing? You've got to be a, yeah, if you invent something, then you've got to be an entrepreneur to, like you're saying, you've got to be an entrepreneur to merchandise. It. Yeah, you can't be just an inventor. You've got to be able to figure out a way to get your product out on the market. So that's what, but today you've got to do, really. and by the way, I'm not running for anything. <laughs> so I can say anything I want. How, how many, all of the, everybody that's running for governor, please stand up. Please stand up. <laughs> <laughs> So none of you are running for governor, so, so I, was, I guess I'm okay there. So anyway, uh, I'm going to talk probably about 25 minutes, and then I'm going to leave a little time for questions. Uh, I can probably answer most of your questions at least. So anyway, uh, talk about reinventing. And look what's happening today. Walmart is reinventing itself. Uh, well, uh, Target's reinventing itself. Most retailers today are reinventing themselves, and that's because of Amazon. So I have a, a list of closing, and I made this out. And so far this year, this is this this year alone, 3,800 uh, businesses, stores are closing already this year. 3,800. 3, you know, just uh, some of them you'd recognize: Toys R Us or Baby R Us went bankrupt. They alone had the 735 stores. But Walgreens has closed 600 stores for state. Uh, Ann Taylor is closing uh, 600 stores. Best Buy is closing 300 stores. They've already closed. A mattress firm has already closed 200 stores, and I just saw the other day they're going to close another 400 stores. Uh, and these are named people. Gap, the Gap has closed over 200 stores so far this year. Uh, Sam's Club, you're closing Sam's Club. A lot of Sam's Clubs are closing around the country. I know in Arizona, uh, they closed several Sam's Clubs down there. Sears, a uh, headline of the Denver Post the other day, Sears has closed 72 stores, 72 more stores. You see that the other day in the Denver Post? Was they had to hit those stores. So the list of Macy's, you know, it goes on and on. So, and these are, Sears is, at one time was the biggest furniture business, or the biggest uh, king of the retail business. It's just about gone, just about gone. So anyway, that's what's closing. In, in the furniture business, a ton of furniture stores have already gone out of business. I have a list here of, of furniture stores that went out of business here in, in Colorado. Uh, a lot of names you'll recognize. Uh, Homestead House, how about Gun Rewards? Gregory's, Levine's, Krause's, Levitt's. You guys remember Levitt's? You know, one time Levitt's, Levitt's had the furniture business in the palm of their hand. They had 200 warehouse showrooms doing $2 billion a year. Oh, bankrupt, went bankrupt twice. You know, so, and uh, Super Dave's, the furniture gallery, Davis Furniture, a 100-year-old furniture store here in Colorado went out recently. Uh, Bodway Furniture, Bernhardt and Thomasville closed their stores. And Casey's, and, you know, it's Davis and Shaw, but it's just a, a, probably in all of them, but there's a list of furniture stores that went out of business here, here in Colorado. So, so what's happening today, you've got to reinvent your business. And, that, and that's what we're doing. And it's working for us guys. Uh, we're up over $10 million this year already, same store sales. Uh, last year we were up $20 million, same store sales. This year we're going to be up over $20 million, same store sales. In a couple of years we're going to do, be, be doing over a billion dollars, American Furniture. We're going to be doing over a billion dollars. Thank you, thank you. So you do it by, by uh, reinventing yourself. Uh, we're going to open three stores in Houston. Uh, our stores are geared for big markets. 
We enjoy a 70% market share here in Colorado. There are certain companies that have put that out, out there publicly that we have a 70% market stores here. So what we've done is we've figured out how to beat Amazon, Wayfair. Amazon's the big gorilla. They're the big gorilla. And we can beat Amazon. Are they going to buy you? Pardon me? Are they going to buy you too? Huh? Are they going to buy you as well? <laughs> no. I'm not going to sell to them. I, I get offers all the time to, to sell out. I get all. Yeah, yeah, we're we're a private company. Yeah, we're a private company. I'm I'm not, my daughter uh, is taking over, giving her stock. I've taken five of the employees. I have a succession plan, and it's working. I've taken out my five best employees and my daughter. She's going to be leading the team, and we're going to keep the company going. So. Uh, I didn't work this hard all these years to, to, to see it go by, by you know. But frankly, I get offers every day to sell out, every day from the big companies. But uh, the thing about private companies is that uh, you can do things not only for business, but you can do good for the community. You know, we give to hundreds and hundreds of charities every year, support a lot of big charities. We, we, people like Easter's Project Cure, uh, some of those charities we really like, like put them in business, you know, and kept them going. So you can do those things. There are no big bonuses. And I've seen, and the, uh, American First is 42 years old, but I've really been in retail business for over 50 years. And in that 50 years, I've seen a lot of companies sell out. And the first thing they do when they sell out, the board of directors or the stockholders or the investment companies, the venture capitalists, says, you know what? You need to raise your prices. We need to make more profit. You need to raise your prices. I've seen it happen over and over and over and over again. But being private, I don't have to do it. I can sell just as cheap as I want to. Which means that you can set your market to any position you want. Exactly. And I have seen that happen time and time again. Yeah. Well, I think that the That's right. That's yeah. right. And you know, I took a page from Walmart. You know, Walmart is the most successful retailer in the history of the world. You know. And I saw them start out. Sam Walmart started out. You know, the, the, the Grizzly, the Kmart was kind of the first guys that start closing stores. You know, and then it was Sears. You know, and it was on and on. The list goes on and on. Now, Sam Walt theory was, I'm going to sell every day at low margins, I'm not going to merchandise products. Most furniture stores, most stores merchandise. Let's say uh, a woman's purse. They'll look at the purse and, <laughs> and, and they'll say, yeah, this, say, this, but then, I, I'm talking about Coles and Macy's, and I'm talking about pretty all the retailers. And they'll say, okay, well that purse, let's say that purse costs $10. Now Walmart says, I'm going to sell it for about $17. That would be his markup. He averaged, his, I'm, I have the same markup as it's in the 35% range. 35%, $17. Well, a lot of stores say, well, hell, I can get $20 for it. Some guys say, I can get $40 for it. You see what I mean? So most every retailer, merchant, what they call merchandises, they look at the product, they see how much they can get for it. But Sam Walton said, no, I'm just going to sell every day. Now, the nice thing about that, he, he doesn't get caught. Somebody else, whoever it is, you know, Sears or, or, or Woolworths or whoever, uh, you know, he, he, he always had the best price. And then he is, you know, Walmart's hugely successful. You know, they're, they're the most successful French store. So I copied him. I copied him. I like to copy successful people. By the way, keep that in mind. Copy successful people. So I copied Walmart. I just sell every day. I don't try to merchant. I get stuff in. A lot of times we'll get something, in, particularly some imported item that, uh, say, this chair you're sitting on, you could buy that probably in China, and I'm sure these chairs are probably made in China, China or Korea or Vietnam or somewhere, you know. Well, you could sell that chair for, it probably cost about $6. So you could sell it maybe for $10, but some stores say, well, I bet I could get $18 for it. You see what I mean? I would say, I'd just sell it for $10. So I don't get caught. Nobody ever sells it anything cheaper than us. So keep that in mind in retail. If you get the work on so on. Now, what happens, volume cures a lot of sins. If you do a lot of volume, all of a sudden, you can start making money. If you don't do much volume, it's 
harder to make money. We do a lot of volume. You do a lot of volume by having good values for people and good pricing. And when you do a lot of volume, that's what we do. We do a lot of volume, and we land up making some money at the end of the day. So keep that in mind. The volume cures a, a lot of sins. Okay, how do we beat, beat Amazon? Amazon uh, is not a factory. They don't buy stuff. They sell other people's merchandise. They've always, they beg us. They're still, still calling us, want us to put our stuff on Amazon. So uh, let's just take, uh, in fact, is let's, let's uh, open up the packets here, and let's go to, uh, go to, uh, I'm going to skip down to, uh, first place, we have these signs all over our store. We beat Amazon, Wayfair, every day, and we do, by big time. And uh, so let's go down to, uh, well, here's Wayfair, for example. Wayfair, see these chairs from Wayfair? And this is brand new. I just made this up. They sell this top chair $166. We sell it for $38. Wow. <laughs> the next one they sell for $124. We sell for $42. The last one called the ghost chair, you have to buy two because they come two to a box. They sell two for $900. We sell two for $116. This is Wayfair. And we get a all the time, we have customers come in. Had one, I talked to a customer the other day. They said, I bought from Overstock. The three big ones are Amazon, of course, the biggest. Wayfair, second. Overstock's the third biggest. They bought this console from Overstock. They paid $800 for it. They came to shop us. We were $188. And Overstock was $800. Same console. The customer just told us just the other day. Uh, so we can just we can beat their, their price every day. So... Uh, I'm going to uh, take this Darcy sofa and I'm going to do the arithmetic on the board over here. I have this uh, board made up. Uh, I think there was a marker here somewhere. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. Now, what Wayfair or, or Amazon, Wayfair, all of them, they sell other people's merchandise. They're not a factory. They don't buy direct from factories. Amazon don't buy anything from factories. They have a retailer, or they have you, you put it on their website, and they sell it for you. Okay. In this case here, this is an Ashley. You've heard of Ashley. They're the biggest furniture company in the world. And this is Darcy, which they've been making this set for probably 20 years. This is uh, Darcy set. I think you got it in the, in the folder, don't you? Yeah. And uh, they have it on their website at $449. And they just lowered it to that. It was for, for forever. It was over 500 bucks, but I think because of us, they've lowered it to 449 dollars. Now we sell it every day at 290 dollars. AFW price is 298 dollars. We can sell it at that, and we can make make that. That's our market for it. That's our margin. We we do all right. Don't worry about us. We're doing all right with it. <laughs> About about two hundred bucks cost, two hundred dollars wholesale. Yeah, so so so. Now, so uh, most retailers sell this. Ashley stores sell this at four hundred forty-nine dollars. Ashley, the Ashley retail stores sell this. We sell it for two hundred ninety-eight dollars. So what's the one reason? They don't care because the volume. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, anyway that so a vendor would put it on onto Amazon. Uh, if, if we put stuff on Amazon, we'd put it on a $298. That's what we, because they, Amazon sells other people's product, right? That's what they do. Okay, now, Amazon charges 15%. And at the recent High Point North Carolina Furniture Market, we met with three vice presidents from Amazon, spent an hour and a half with them, and they've been asking us to put our stuff on Amazon. And so I sat there and I thought, well, if I could negotiate that 15% down to like 5%, then maybe we'd make some sense. But they wouldn't negotiate. That 15% is non-negotiable by the guys. So if you put something on, if you put your product on Amazon or you put your product on Amazon, they're going to want 15%. That's holy grail to them. So, which is way too much. I, got, I don't have that kind of margin in my product where I can put it on for 15%. Are you following me? So, but the 15% at the end, end, end of the, the day would be about, so Amazon, 
at the end of the day, it would be about $70. Now, they have free freight. And this is the killer case. And this is starting to catch up with them. Free freight. Really? Freight is free? Come on. Freight is not free. In fact, is that an article uh, was just in the uh, Wall Street Journal the other day. Banned from Amazon. The shoppers who make too many returns. How many of you guys read that? Anybody read that? Some of you guys read that? Yeah, this is in the Wall Street Journal. So this is a big article how Amazon is banning shoppers that return too many merchandise to them. They have to do it. Because what, what do they do? If you return something to a factory or to Amazon or anything, what do they do with it? They probably junk it or give it to a liquidator for 10 cents of the dollar or something. So this free freight is bogus. And the reason it's out there is the people that started Amazon, Jeff Bezos was never in the furniture business. He was never a delivery driver for us. He was never, he don't know that, he thinks that some fairy godmother picks it up and takes it out to your house. The fairy godmother can't handle furniture. It's too heavy, it's too big. It's, freight is not free, guys, not free. So it's catching up with them. And this is true with everybody. This free freight, free freight thing, little by little, we're gonna see it change. Because we're all figuring out we get way too much merchant back. If it's too easy to return, too easy to send back, you're going to get merchandise back. So what do you do with it? What do they do with it? Well, most of the time, they say, keep it, we'll send you another one, is what they do most of the time. Isn't that right? How many of you guys bought on Amazon? Yeah, 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 just keep it. We'll send you another one. Because the freight is some, more, worth more than them, so it's catching up with it. But, that, but then they have to deliver. They're going to sell, say, a $298, so they have to deliver it. So the freight, the free freight, and I got the, the actual numbers here, is about $45 cost. But they have to pay for a third party to set it up. And they probably won't even set it up in your house for that. Now, easy return. And this is a real killer. The easy returns. If you tell people they can have easy returns, they'll easy return it. Does that make sense? And there's just story after story. The owner of Franklin Manufacturing Company at the last High Point Market I was talking to, he said he, he sent a sofa to Whitefish, Montana. Now, I happen to know where Whitefish, Montana is, because I'm from Montana. I was born and raised in Montana, had a factory up there for 37 years. Whitefish is right on the Canadian border. It's the end of the world. When you get to Whitefish, Montana, and you look off, that's the end of the world right there. <laughs> So he had the sofa in Whitefish, Montana, and the customer didn't like it. Now, to send it back, his, his factories in Houston, Mississippi, would cost him over $300. So what does he do? Keep it. The freight's worth more, and he gets the back, it's probably a couple damage, you know. So, so, so this easy returns, by guys, is a, is, a, is a merchandising thing that went in by we're not real world people that haven't been in the trenches, not people that haven't been there and done that. These are geeks or whatever you want to call them that think that that make it easy to buy. But in the real world, guys, easy returns is a bogus business practice. Okay? So easy returns. If I add this up, what do I get? 8, 18, 10, 20, 21, 5. $458. So this is where it, the Amazon price is right, right around that, right around in there. It'll change. Amazon changed because they have a lot of different, they probably got a, a dozen different Ashley stores putting it on their website. You'll find it in there for over $500. So you buy it every day at American Furniture, $298. Buy it on Amazon for $458. Now, the other thing that's, that happened. Uh, at the last High Point Market, excuse me, I was, uh, uh, the National Home Purchasing Association asked me to mentor a bunch of smaller dealers. And so I was sitting at a big, huge round table with a bunch of small dealers. And we do a lot of that, by the way. We have people come from, people come from all over the world and went to our warehouse, toward our warehouse, to our facilities. I like, I, I'm a sheriff. The reason I'm standing here today 
I'm a sharer. I like to share. I don't think there's no really big secrets. Is there really big secrets out there? That's right. Be transparent. So, in a way, uh, they asked me to mentor these small dealers. And this was an hour and a half session at the North Carolina Furniture Market. And I'm sitting there listening to them, and what kept coming up is damaged furniture. We could damage furniture, damage furniture. And I was sitting there thinking, mm, I don't, we don't get damaged furniture. And finally, one of the people there spoke up to who knew me. He said, Jake, what you don't understand, you buy everything in full truckloads, in full containers, they ship it direct from the factory, and you get it and unload it, it's not damaged. And people were handling it. We don't do that. We have LTL. You know what LTL is? Less than truckloads. So they have less, so they get, they're moving it from this factory to this distribution center to this warehouse to this another distribution warehouse. They're handling it probably 15 times. The first warehouse is, you know, it's, it's, it's taking it off the truck, or putting it in racks, storage, whatever, and then they take it back out, put it on another truck, and it goes to the other warehouse and does the same thing. Now, that same drill happens with Amazon. If you're putting something on Amazon, it's going to different uh, fulfillment centers. They handle it 10 or 15 times. Most people that have bought on Amazon, it's come in damaged. I speak to a lot of college kids, speak to a lot of people, and most of them say, my furniture came in damaged. Came in damaged. Because it was handled so many times. The uh, uh, fulfillment center, or the uh, uh, FedEx, FedEx has got a warehouse right close to our, our store over there on, the, on the Parker. And uh, go in there, and you watch them handling it. They, they, it's, to them, it's a box. And they're going... It's just a box, and it's damaged. So it boasts, everything you're going to buy on the internet on big things like that are going to come in damaged. It's the same thing that happens with Amazon. They're not furniture people, so they're going to handle it just like uh, the FedEx and uh, all the other people that deliver it. So we, we have almost no furniture damage. So what the point I'm belaboring this, so what we've done, we've reinvented ourselves, and we've got these... Like I say, we got this sign all over our store. We beat Amazon. And this, is no, this, is not, this is no BS. This is true. So just look at it. Google it up. Google that sofa up. Google up chairs. They'll sell chairs for 400 bucks that we sell for $98. Crazy. Market. So today, you got to read. And this is what Sears, the reason Sears failed, the stores got old. Now, when you walk into a Walmart store, they've got everything, and they've got everything you need now. Right? They've got toothpaste. They've got soap. They've got everything. And it's nicely displayed. It's easy to get to. And Sears didn't listen to the consumer. Well, we, what should we have that they want now? You know? And they got, oh, Levitt's. The Levitt's used to have big stores here in Colorado. They had five stores here in Colorado and Colorado Springs. And then one of their, 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 their buyer's office was here in Colorado. They had a huge 200,000, uh, they were doing $2 billion a year. And they had 200 of these huge warehouse shows. Gone. Stores got old. Prices got too high. Uh, and what happened with, with Levitt's? When, uh, when Levitt's was going like this, the Levitt's family decided to an IPO. You all know what an IPO is, initial public offering. And they saw, and that's a temptation. People, I got a gal who's just hammering me to buy out. I finally had my daughter write her a better layoff because we're not going to sell out. But it's a temptation, you've been, been as long as I have, to sell out to somebody, live the good life in the Bahamas, or if it is a good life, I don't know. I've really kind of been there and done that. When I was younger and playing music, we talked about earlier, I played music, I played with Marty Robbins, the lead guitar player, and I've kind of been there and done all that stuff. And uh, it's okay to help out in West Texas. Now, now, if I could sing like Marty, I'd still be playing music. <laughs> but I couldn't sing like Marty. I'm a pretty good lead guitar player. I'm not that good of a singer. So, so anyway, uh, the point I'm making is that uh, so, so many of these people sell out. It happens every time. You know, the owner gets older, investment company, somebody buys him out. 
and we're not going to go there. We're going to stay a private company, keep with good, good bargains, and keep give people a a, a goodbye. Uh, we just got back from a trip, four of us, me and three other buyers. We went to China, went to Vietnam, went to Malaysia, went to Singapore. Well, these are tough trips. The trip from the, the plane ride from San Francisco to Hong Kong is 14 hours. That's one leg of the journey. By the time you leave home and you check in a, in a hotel in, in Hong Kong or Guangdong or wherever you're going, Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh City, or wherever you're going, it's 22, 24 hours. So that's the 24-hour plane trip each way. I do that twice a year, by the way. I do it in uh, March. I do it again in September. Now, why do I do that? Because we're buying from the factories that make this stuff. See what I'm talking about? We're buying the factory that makes this chair. We're buying from the factory that made this table. And that's what these other guys don't do. So what's happened? And, and I, I was one of the first guys to start traveling overseas 40 years ago. And what I did when I started American Furniture Warehouses, I want to I want to compete with the big boys. I want to play with the big boys. Who are the big boys? Walmart, Target, Ikea, Costco. I don't know. I want to, I want to play with them. Now, if you're going to play with the big boys, you better buy it right. You better find the first cost. You better find the source. So I started doing that. I started, at first, at first it was Taiwan. I started going to Taiwan and Hong Kong. This is 40 some years ago, that's when the markets were, and then the factories were. Then, when China opened up, when uh, Mo Xi died in 1978, Deng became the premier of, of China, and uh, he uh, been to the U.S. I don't know if you remember that with Deng, Deng Zipong. He was the U.S. Went to remember he was in Iowa with the farm, which was a little short, kind of a homely short guy in a way, and he uh, uh, world traveler. And he got up in front of the big uh, Politburo in uh, Beijing and said, wouldn't it be nice if you let the farmers free market some of their crops? From that statement, uh, China changed to a free market the economy. Because what happened? Up until then, people were starving. When Mo, when, when Mo Zedong took over China in 1949, 40 million people started to death. On my dad's side of the family, my dad was born and raised in Poland. And in 1916, the Russians came into that part of the Poland and drafted him in the Russian army. And my dad was in the Russian army when Lenin and the communists took over Russia. As you know, Lenin and the communists took over Russia in 1917. And my dad was in the Russian army under Lenin, and he was in there for seven years. And they wouldn't let him out because he could uh, my heritage is German. There were Germans living in Poland on my dad's side, Germans living on Russia on my mother's side. And, uh, so he could speak German, Polish, and Russian, and they needed a interpreter real bad, so they wouldn't let him out. So he was in the Russian army for seven years, right when Lenin and the communists started. And what he told is pretty well parallels. If you're interested in that, get out your encyclopedia and read about Lenin. What happened, he says, is 20 million people start to Because the reason that communism and socialism doesn't work is they take your land away from you. There's no private property. Well, if you can't Keep what you raise or what you earn. Why would you work? So that's why communism and socialism fails. And that's what they did. They took all the land away. They had these community farms. My dad says the people wouldn't even, the tractor wouldn't even drive to them. At 5 o'clock, whistle would blow, and they wouldn't even drive the tractor to the end of the road. They just shut it off in the middle of the field. There was no incentive. See, the reason that socialism comes, there's no incentive. And, and the reason that I'm successful is I have incentives for my employees. I have incentives, I have my delivery. How many guys had furniture delivered for American furniture? Yeah. 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 That's right. And, and, and the reason for it is I pay them a commission. Our delivery drivers make seventy to $80,000 a year delivering furniture. They make more than a college graduate <laughs> driver. I'm serious, they do. But I pay them. I have incentive programs for them. My salesmen are on incentive. If, if people can keep what they earn, they'll work. And they'll work the hard, they'll work the overtime. They'll do a good job, yeah. So that, and that's why this kind of system works. They take your private property away, 
They don't believe in free enterprise, free market. They don't believe in entrepreneurship. You know, the, the, at the heart of every successful business is probably some entrepreneurship. Pardon me? Okay. Successful business, the heart of almost every successful business, there's an entrepreneur probably involved in that, in that business to make it successful. So keep that in mind to be successful. So anyway, with my background, I know communism. So what happened in China, going back to China? First time I went to China in 1982. I'm talking about mainland China now. And my daughter sat along with me. We saw piles of rice on the road. We wonder what in the world piles, because growing up in Montana, I was growing and raised on a farm in Montana, and we always sent our wheat to China. And that's what everybody did here. Everybody, even in eastern Colorado, they sent their wheat to China. You guys, I see some hands are going to go like this. You can hold that. And all of a sudden, when, when Deng said, let farmers free market half of the crops, all of a sudden, China, instead of being an importer of food, became an exporter. And the reason that this rice was piled along the roads, I asked questions, is they didn't have the infrastructure to take it to market. They didn't have the roads, they didn't have the deep sea ports, they didn't have the railways, they didn't have the ships, they didn't have the containers, and they couldn't take it to market, so they were piling up along the road. So just that quick, China changed to, from a country that couldn't feed itself to a country that was exporting rice. So that's the difference between free market and socialism. You get to keep, keep, keep what you earn. So anyway, uh, I encourage all of you to uh, uh, become uh, uh, active in, in, in uh, uh, charities. Uh, we have what we call a community report, and uh, we give this to people that come in, some of our vendors, it shows pictures of uh, here. Uh, I speak to colleges, you know, at, there's a Monta my alma mater, Montana State University, built a building called the Jabs Building. It's called the Jabs College of Business and Entrepreneurship, Montana State. And by God, and that, that college is growing 15% a year. The Jake Jabs Business of College and Entrepreneurship is growing 15% a year, and has every year. Now, before I built the building, Montana State didn't, didn't even know they had a business college there. Missoula, the university is there, there, but now, actually, it's, it's past Missoula the University. I'm helping CU. In fact, they're going to put my name on it, that downtown building, the CU building, would be Jake Jabs. School of Entrepreneurship on the building down there. So I believe in helping entrepreneurship. Uh, we said J.A. Junior Achievement, uh, Thornton Store, the finance park, the Junior Achievement Finance Park is, loaded, is located in our Thornton Store. Now the Junior Achievement uh, uh, Finance Park is, is they have different vendors there. Like Elway has a car dealership there, they have a bank there, they have a finance company there, they have a home builder there, a furniture. And the kids go through this. What they do is that when they start out, they say, okay, how much are you going to make? And most kids say, well, I'm going to make about 50000 a year. Most kids, most, it varies. Okay, you go through the park, you're going to buy a house, buy a furniture, buy a car. You can't buy a $50,000 car if you're only going to make $50,000 a year. So it's a lesson economic. I will sit at my kids' bill. <laughs> You can't, so it, this is a great thing. We call it Junior Achievement Finance Park, and it teaches kids to be physically, financially responsible. It's a great program, and it's headquartered in our, our Thornton store. So it was there. We're a great supporter uh, of a different school. We have a program now that, uh, uh, where this came from, I was driving down University Boulevard one day, and there was a bunch of kids, it was a cold November day, there's a kid standing out there, and he had mattress, buy a mattress signs on, on the street. Right? So I stuck my nose into it, and they sell these mattresses at the schools. And they give a percentage of it to the school. You talk about a ripoff. They sell a, a mattress that should sell for 400 bucks for $1,500, and they give a percentage to the schools. Not the way to buy a mattress. <laughs> a mattress, you should lay on it, you should feel it, to make sure it's the right size, it's soft, it's hard, whatever. Something there. Is there a better way? So we have this here. We call it better your home, better your school. If the school, if the parents come in, the kids are going to that school, and they buy a mattress from us, we donate four percent of that back to the school. So it gives, helps schools with money, and uh, 
and also if they buy anything else, you get two percent. And we have I can't believe how this is millions of dollars that we land up giving to schools every year. Unbelievably successful. So it's called giving back. This is a picture of my building, and I designed the building in, in Bozeman, Montana, Montana State. And I came, came from. I spoke every year to them, as I speak to every year to a lot of different colleges. And most college buildings are kind of old and moldy classrooms. I said, I want a modern, contemporary building. When they go in that building, they don't like they're going to a school building. They go to a nice, modern office building, and it's worked. So this is the Jake Jab Center for Entrepreneurship at CU, the CU Business College downstairs. We do Toys for Tots, Project Recycle, uh, Epic, their thing is headquartered up at our Wadsworth store. We help with that. We do the, the parade, the... Uh, Parade of Lights, have you ever seen us in the Parade of Lights? That's my girlfriend there, and me in the Parade of Lights every year. It's been nice the last couple of years. That one year it was like zero. Uh, 13 below. 13 below. <laughs> that's right, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Easter Seals is my, Easter Seals is my favorite charity. Just, I've been doing that for 40 years. They have a handy camp up at Georgetown. If you ever get a chance, go up there. They have a, one of the buildings up there named after me. It's called Jake's Place. Uh, we support them with all their furniture, dining room stuff, all the mattresses for the thing. But it's open a year round now, and they help people with everything from, from uh, wheelchairs to uh, computer stuff. And it's, uh, it's really successful. It's all volunteers. We go up there and clean their camp for them. Uh, with a bunch of our, our people, but Easter Seals, you get a chance, south of Georgetown, great facilities, open year round, they have a, a stroke victim, thing where they have stroke victims, go up there, and uh, that's that thing. Food drives, but anyway, this is something that encourages you, you're going into business to come up with a community, community port. It feels good to give, give back. So maybe just in closing, how long have I, how long much, how long I have to get up? My best speeches are two hours. <laughs> <laughs> you probably don't want to do two hours, but maybe uh, I'll just kind of close with uh, a little bit of the, the, the Jake Jab story, and I'll open it up for questions. I was born and raised in uh, rural Mont Lodge Grass, Montana. It's a small town. Yeah, I'll show you how small it was. I was born November 23rd, and I won the first baby of the year contest. I went back from my class reunion last summer, and I was the only one there. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to figure out who sent me the invitation. <laughs> we had a sign, had a sign that said, slow down, resume speed, both in the same sign. <laughs> Why not the town hooker, still a virgin? <laughs> That's a small town. <laughs> There were nine kids, and I, my parents were immigrants. I'm a first-generation American. And the uh, advantage, I think, of being a first-generation American is that you appreciate America. And my dad escaped. Both my parents escaped communism, both of them. And, and they really appreciate America for you get to keep with your... There were nine kids in the family. There were a family of musicians, by the way. And my dad played violin. I was playing in the Lodgegrass High School band when I was in second grade. So I also played banjo, a family band. All the years we played bands, worked my way through college. My dad wanted us to go to college. My dad only went to the second grade. My mother only went to the seventh grade. He always kind of left out. He wanted to get an education. He, and he, he said, I want you all to go to college. We did. All of us went to college. And in those days, you could register at Montana State College for 50 bucks. And he gave us the 50 bucks, and then you were on your own. <laughs> so we had to work, whatever. And then we landed up, had a band, landed up playing music. Pardon me? Lodge Grass, yeah. or Bozeman, Montana State College, Bozeman, yeah, Bozeman, yeah. And uh, a lot of that's in this book, and by the way, I brought some books with me. This is a, this is a picture of the band I had in college, the Rocky Mountaineers, that's me. I was playing steel guitar in those days. My brother there, we had his band, and we made money going to college, actually. Uh, this is when I was in the military, I was stationed in, uh, spent most of my military career in Morocco. Uh, played in Morocco with the Country Western Band. And uh, three of us brothers were home and leave at the same time. We got our picture together. It's me and two of my brothers who were in the service during the Korean War. Sometimes at 
these extra things, uh, effort you put in, opens doors. And by the way, I sell these books for five bucks, but that's about what they cost me, so I don't even make 35% on these books. <laughs> and uh, another one I wrote is, I wrote this in 2008, how to survive a recession. And a lot of speakers give these away, but I don't know, being an entrepreneur, I had to get my cost out, so I sell them for five bucks. But I think it's, if you don't have any skin in the game, sometimes I think you're more likely to read it if you've got a little investment in it. You know, so anyway, they're available to use for, for five, five bucks a piece. But uh, I took ROTC in college, uh, got a commission in the Air Force, uh, Air Force and uh, my first assignment uh, I was at a radar site in Point Arena, California. You need, to you need to have a secret clearance to be at a radar site. And I was an adjutant personnel officer at this radar site. My buddy said, Jake, fill out an application for top secret clearance. So I did. But Twix came in and I said, we need an officer to go to the European theater of war with a top secret clearance. So the Korean war is on. The Korean war is over here. And I'm going to European theater of war. The point I'm making, sometimes those extra things you do open the doors. Landed up, I spent most of my military career in North Africa. At that time, it was called French Morocco. And I delivered top secret mail all over the whole northern part of Africa. All the Navy installation, American, uh, the Air Force, the Special Weapons Station. So uh, yeah, courier. Security courier. I had a top secret clearance, delivered to courier, top secret clearance. And there was a civil war going on when I was there. The, the Arabs were booting the French out. And so the diplomatic couriers wouldn't come in. So I ended up delivering the top secret mail to the American embassies, American attaches. A really neat experience. I got flying pay. I traveled 24 countries delivering top secret mail. A neat experience for a 21-year-old second lieutenant in the Air Force. But the lesson learned there. So anyway, I played music all the time over there. We had a band, played the Armed Service Network, played for the bullfights in Casablanca. We had this country western band. They'd wheel us down in the middle. We played for the bullfights in Casablanca. Anyway, I got out of the service, went back to the farm, and two of my brothers had got out of the service before I did. And it was a small, small farm ranch in Montana. My dad, my parents were always just scared of the recession. Back that generation, they were scared to expand because of the recession, because they went through that 30s recession, which was probably the worst recession in the history of America. And they went through there, so we'd say, Dad, Buy that 40 acres. Oh, no, there's a recession. There's a recession. So he wouldn't expand the ranch and farm. It was always kind of small. So when I got out of service and went back, two of my brothers were on the ranch. So I went out on my own. In fact, is, my family still, most of my family still lives in Montana. Both of my siblings actually have a daughter living in Billings. I have some grandchildren in Montana. So I was on my own. I hooked up with a, uh, with a uh, uh, Grand Ole Opry band, toured with them. I landed up in Nashville, Tennessee. And I was playing my guitar for Ray Price and uh, uh, huh? Webb Web Pierce. Web Pierce. Um, and the Hitchin Post Bar right across from the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, any country western fans know who Ray Price is, he's, he's, he was one of the biggest country stars. In fact, he had the number one song on the country charts, and Webb Pierce had the number two song. Now, I'm playing my guitar for him in the Hitchin Post and uh, get done and Ray Price is coming to rehearse with Jake at WSM. We're going on tour and see if we go on tour with us. I made the decision that night, I'm not going to be a roadie musician. Now, if I could sing like Ray Price or Webb Pierce, I'd probably still be doing this. But, I, but I'm a pretty good guitar player, but I, uh, I decided I'm going back to Bozeman. I made money going to college teaching guitar. And uh, uh, so I started a little guitar studio in Bozeman, Montana. And uh, that was uh, 19, uh, yeah, it's been 1953, 1953. And uh, so I did. And if you remember in the 50s, everyone ever played the guitar? The secret to free enterprise, free market, entrepreneurship, is find a demand to fill that demand. That's the secret to market. Look at Mark Zuckerberg on Facebook. He found a demand there. And by the way, he's reinventing Facebook. Look at Bill Gates with Microsoft. Again, found a need, 
he's reinventing Microsoft. And all of these great entrepreneurs are all reinventing themselves. Amazon is reinventing themselves. So I think if you go into business today, you can't sit on your laurels. You've got to keep reinventing yourself and keeping up with the time. And that's what I do, we do, in America for its warehouse. So anyway, I uh, went back to Bozeman, and there was, a for, uh, there was a store for sale right downtown in the middle of Bozeman, Montana, for sale. Uh, it was a partnership, and one of the partners, uh, did, did, I, could have bought his, I could buy his half interest for $1,500. Now, this was 1953. So I bought half interest in his music store for $1,500. Uh, the lesson learned there, I'd saved up $1,500. And I made a deal with my partner, I'd buy his half interest out for $3,000. So a year later, I'm down at the bank trying to borrow $3,000. The trouble with bit retail business, guys, you've got to put money back in the business. Need more delivery trucks, need more computers, need more inventory, more accounts receivable. You know what I mean. So businesses, you know, if you're going into business to make get rich, it's probably going to work. You got to put the money back in the business. And I did that for years. And years. Finally, finally, there comes a day yeah. when, you, when you do have some money, but it's down the road away. And a year later, it wasn't there. I didn't have the three thousand dollars. I'm in the bank trying to borrow the three thousand dollars. He says, do you have a financial statement? I said, what? I graduated in college in BOAG. I'm supposed to be a BOAG teacher in high school. So I, did, I didn't have the $3,000, and I didn't know what a financial statement was either. So we're sitting in front of the banker, what's your assets, what's your liabilities, what's your cash flow, and all those questions that I didn't know. And I could tell he's not going to lend me his $3,000. And I had to get rid of my partner. The reason I had to get rid of my partner is, if you remember, in the 50s, Elvis Presley was the hottest item. Elvis Presley, he announced the record. He sold a million copies, but he announced the record. He was the hottest item. And kids would come in and say, I want an Elvis Presley record. He'd say, we don't sell Elvis Presley records here. He didn't like Elvis Presley. He didn't like country music. So the lesson learned there was he was running off my customers. Follow me? Now, the secret to business, guys, is you've got to sell what the public wants. I wasn't a real big Elvis fan, but his record sold like crazy. I got so I liked him. You follow me? You got to sell what the public wants. And I think one reason I've been successful, because I don't come from the furniture business. I come from a farm. And my family is a farm person. And I just sell what sells. Right now, this Magnolia stuff is coming like crazy. You know? So we sell whatever is hot, this white stuff, this distressed white stuff, this vintage stuff, this rustic stuff. I think one reason so we're probably the only furniture store that sells that stuff. The reason we can sell it, most furniture stores don't sell it because they get way too much back. But I sell it right. I have all these information tags. If you've been in our store, you see these information tags. This is rustic and all this stuff, and it may finishes may vary and all that stuff. And in fact, the owners of Ashley, and Ashley does four billion a year, that makes worth my store. The owner of Ashley and his son, who's the CEO and vice president of Ashley now, owns this store. Originally, the owner was in with 12 VPs, and the son was in the next couple weeks later with, with eight of his designers and decorators. So these are the biggest furniture company in the world spent a lot of times in our stores. And I was talking to him, well, why don't you get that real, we sell a lot of this real rustic leather, this natural leather. And he said, Jake, you don't understand. We can't sell it. Because they got, Ashley has 800 Ashley home stores. And they don't know how to sell it. We get it back, and we can't. Handle it we can't. So I can't sell. So I actually won't make this real natural leather stuff. We sell it like crazy. So the point I'm making is I've learned to swing with the punches and sell what people want. And that's the secret to whatever you do, whatever you guys do. Yes. <laughs> make it go further. <laughs> but the story about the guy goes in the furniture store and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, Amy grows up in a furniture store with his, dog, with his dad, Sammy. And uh, finally comes time for Amy to go buy the sofas. So he comes back and the sofa's got stripes going this way, and stripes going this way, stripes going this way. Pops says, what's the matter with you, Amy? Don't you learn nothing? You never sell the sofa. He says, don't worry, Pop. I sell the sofa. So every day, Pop comes in. The Jewish tradition is that every day, Dad comes in the store and gets 
crawling out. But the dad finally comes in. He don't see A.B. around. He hears this boning, this boning in the back room. He goes in the back room. A.B.'s on this couch. He's all scratched up, bleeding and bloody. But the sofa was gone. He said, my goodness, what happened? Didn't the man like the sofa? He said, yeah, Poppy liked the sofa, but the C&I dog, he went crazy. <laughs> So, just to tra transfer real fast, from uh, the reason I got I, I landed up doubling my volume every year I had the music store, very successful. I doing a million dollars a year on music store, made money playing music on weekends, bringing it up to cash register. I was teaching 175 kids. Made a deal with Montana State because I had a degree in education, a minor in music. If they'd send kids down there, they could get a, a, a credit for music 101 at Montana State. So they were feeding me students. He's in like 175 kids a week. And lessons, classes, $1.75 a lesson is cash. And uh, playing music on weekends, running the store, uh, made money. <laughs> went to open store in Billings, Montana, which is a bigger market, and they wouldn't let me take my franchise with me. The music business in those days, had to have, you had to have Fender guitars, Gibson guitars, con banners with little long term hits. And in Bozeman, I had the best franchise. So I went to Billings and said, no, you can't sell it because we have a dealer there and we're protecting this dealer. Now, the lesson learned there, a lot of times franchises are not good. They restrict you to your marketing area. And that limits to you what you can do. So I lost interest in the, in the music business. And um, you've got to have a passion for what you do. I, if there's one thing, at the end of the day, when I speak to a lot of people, they say, on well, my list of 39, I'll go through that real fast in a second. I have a passion for what you can do. And if you don't have a passion for what you do, when I speak to the college kids, I say, if you don't like what you do and have a passion, go do something else. You're probably going to change cr curriculum four times, and you're probably going to change businesses many times. And you guys have changed businesses. So I bet everybody in this room has changed business four or five times. So if you don't have a passion for it, go to something else. It's a passion for the music business. I was married by then and had a wife, and it was about noon, and my wife's going, you going to work today? <laughs> <laughs> so I lost my passion. So I sold my stores. Well, I actually had three stores. I retired. I was 30 years old. First time I retired, I was 30 years old. And then I was short circuit to uh, American Furniture Warehouse. I had a factory in the middle there, and some of those things I did distribute company. And, uh, but I, one nice thing. I didn't have to take jobs, and I can encourage this with young people. Uh, I've always been debt-free. Right now, guys, i got money in the bank. I have no debt. Back then, even then, uh, you know, I paid that $3,000 back to that bank, and I've been a debt-free. Now, the nice thing about that, for young people, you don't have to take the first job that comes along. You can look for opportunities. You don't have to take the first job. Are you following me? And that's what I, when I got out of the music business, I was offered jobs. I didn't take any of them. So anyway, the, uh, so happened that the, in, in, I had a factory in Montana. I was selling uh, down on furniture. I was selling Mangurians who had that big furniture store there down on Furniture Road. They wanted to sell the big arches in front of it. By the way, they went out of business. I didn't have that on my list. And um, they went out of business. The old American furniture company went out of business. Every furniture store. This was 74, 75. Every furniture store down there had went out of business. I said, it looked like there was an opportunity for this farm kid from Montana to open up a furniture store in a big market like Colorado. So I bought the assets of the old American. The old American furniture had eight stores. It went out of business and moved all of their stuff into that big warehouse building. And it was on their books that a million and a half dollars worth of assets. This was furniture trucks, forklifts, warehouse racks, adding machines, Anybody remember? How about a typewriter? Anybody remember the typewriter? Remember a typewriter? <laughs> anyway, it was a million and a half dollars worth of assets. I gave eighty thousand dollars cash. Cash talk. Eighty thousand dollars cash for a million and a half dollars worth of assets. I made a million dollars that day because I was going to use that stuff. And uh, so I. Uh, uh, we went to the North Carolina furniture market and we bought a million dollars worth of furniture and they shipped it because they had a one credit, good credit. I talk to young people, keep good credit, keep some cash. You'll never know when good credit will open the door. Because my good credit, they shipped a million. If you had a one credit rating, factories would automatically ship you. They still will today. 
They shipped a million dollars worth. Now, so I had now, this is this is 180, you remember my first store down on Van Ock Street? You guys remember that down there? That big sign on the freeway that had American furniture on it? But anyway, uh, that was 180,000 square foot. It's, it's this furniture row showroom now, that real expensive showroom. That was my original store. Anyway, so I had this 180,000 square foot building full of furniture, and I needed to sell it. And uh, so uh, it was recommended to me that you, you make commercials, I need to turn it, so I got on TV. At that time, there were just four broadcast stations. There was Channel 2, 4, 7, and 9. And I called them up, and Channel 2 uh, gave me the best price. So they sent four people down. They sent a videographer, a uh, talent, a uh, lighting guy, and uh, uh, a script writer. And uh, so this, I'm reading this copy, and this, this, we were phoning this three-piece living room. They had it set in a corner, like a three-piece sofa loves to chair. We sold it for $199. This guy's saying this wonderful, beautiful, gorgeous, long-lasting, and I'm looking at this thing and I'm saying, it's kind of a POS, actually. So, <laughs> what is POS, Jennifer? So I said, no, no, no. So I took the script away from him and started crossing off all these adjectives. And... Um, the, the talent, he didn't know furniture from a hole in the ground. So I said, I'm going to do the commercial myself. And the lesson learned there, guys, today you have to be honest in advertising. Be honest. And the reason it worked, I was honest. I didn't exaggerate. I didn't lie. I didn't oversell. I didn't overpromise. And today, it's imperative that you're honest. People can blog you. They can really say bad things. About they, yeah, you know what Yelp is? You know what Yelp is? Their mission is to say bad things about you. I've looked up, most of our social media says great things about us. I'd say 98% of it. But Yelp says something. So we called up Yelp. They said, for $50,000, we'll say something nice about you. Until then, all we're going to do is say nasty things about you. This is a true story. Yelp's goal is to say nasty things. And if you've got to pay them $50,000 to get the nice full blackmail, but the point I'm making is today people can Facebook you, they can YouTube, they can, you know, they can Twitter you, they can do whatever. You gotta be and I preach that to young people, to be honest. Now, the nice thing about that it makes business more fun. You gotta be have some fun in it. So pick with young people. So if you're just honest, it just makes the you don't have to worry about the salesman said, you don't have to worry about the delivery driver said, you don't have to worry about the customer service said, you don't have to worry about the manager said. Everybody's honest. It makes business. So we have fun in America. We have fun. I think all of them, if you pull most of our employees, I think 98% of them would say, yes, we enjoy working there and we have fun. Because you don't need to lie, you don't need to exaggerate, you just, just tell the truth. So today, it's imperative to be honest. So we're very successful. Just to, to the very, very last thing is we will fly through these things. To do, how long have I been? I just, it's ready. So let's just fly through these things. Now, uh, in a packet here, there's 39 reasons for business success. This is a speech that I normally give to colleges and high school kids. And this is a 45-minute speech. So I'm going to cut it down to five minutes for you guys. And uh, kind of by importance, number one, the secret to free enterprise, free to, secret to inventing, free target to entrepreneurship is find a need. Find a need to be successful. There's a need there always a pent-up demand. So that's the secret. Number two is be honest. We talk about that. Become social media savvy. And that's kind of neat. And that's the other thing that why business have to reinvent themselves. Remember newspapers? How many remember a newspaper? Do you remember what a newspaper is? <laughs> us, us older generations, we read the paper. But young people today, cuss me, guys. When I speak to college kids, nobody. I say, for you guys that don't know what a newspaper is, when you're driving up a driveway and there's a bump, that's a newspaper. <laughs> yeah, because young people, trust me, don't take the paper. Nobody takes the paper. Nope. TV is getting so fragmented, and, and people with Netflix and, and uh, Hulu and all those stuff, that, you know, now they got, I got over a thousand channels in my content. So you got to reinvent yourself in advertising. The old days of running radio, TV and newspaper are gone. 
we, radio is really expensive. We're close to doing business with this, but we don't run zero radio. TV is really fragmented. We run, we're turning our newspaper back every, I, that, I, I, I turned all of my advertising over to my daughter. We have meetings about once a week. We need to get out of the newspaper. So, so anyway, so you can do it on social media. It works, social media. Live below your means. Keep your credit good. Use credit cards. And let's jump down. Have a passion for what you do, number 10. Uh, 14, entrepreneurs don't. I've studied entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs don't do it for the money. They do it because they're, they're contributing back. They're helping society. They're doing good things. And I've studied true entrepreneurs do it because they're helping, making things better, making the world better. They don't do it for the money. I've never did it for the money. I've never did it for the money. I did it because I believe giving people a bargain and so forth. So anyway, work your way through college. Keep physically fit. 22, it's okay to be a workaholic. It's good for you. Therapeutic. And uh, enjoy what you're doing. You never make a day in your life. I plagiarized that. So anyway, that's uh, my thing there. Uh, this, uh, this is my Jabs building. Uh, this is the power of 50 here. Uh, we're rated three in the country. Uh, this is every big, 50 biggest retailers are listed here. We're number three in the nation. Not bad for, not bad for, for this farm kid from Montana. Be number three in the nation. Okay. okay. How we can beat selling on the internet? I think I pretty much went over that. Uh, on the back side is free trade. Maybe to talk about free trade because that's today. That's the biggest conversation in the world today is free trade. Now. What's Trump's take on free trade? In my opinion, now America is the biggest consumer of goods in the world. We consume more goods than either any country in the world. So what Trump knows this. So he's, he's negotiating from strength. You see what I mean? See, you see, he negotiates, he says, we're the biggest consumer of goods, so we can't get the bad end of a trade deal. We need to even out some of these trailers. For example, when we're in China and we get into a fancy car, a BMW or, or a Mercedes-Benz or something like that, we say, what does it cost? They'll, they'll say it costs like $100,000 in China. Really? Why? Because it's a 30% import. Rate. If you send cars to China, you send them to Japan. There's a tax on American cars in Japan and China. But cars coming from China here, there's no duties or tax on. So a lot of these trade agreements probably need to be renegotiated. Because I think for years, we always, and I'm not, I'm not really against that, we were in favor of the third world countries, and maybe that comes from my background of growing up poor and everything. But I think he, he's trying to figure, and it's working because, you know, the gosh, the unemployment rate is what, 3.2% or something like that, you know. So, but free trade, now this is not mine. I. I'm talking about this free trade article here on the back side of the thing. So this is from the Economist magazine. I'm just going to read the first two, two paragraphs. You all, you all have this in your, your thing. It's on the back side of uh, how to beat the Internet selling. Keep going. Keep going. I don't think you're getting warm. Right there it is. There you go. I'll turn it on the back side. Okay says, economists are virtually unanimous that trade makes the world richer, enable countries to specialize and make workers more productive, gives consumers more choice, and reduces costs. So that's what's, what they're saying there. Uh, Korea, like we sell Samsung TVs made in Korea. You know, we don't make TVs in America. So if, if Korea can make TVs cheaper, then they should be entitled to make TVs. Uh, if they can make work in Rutan cheaper in the Philippines, or, or some of those countries, they should be able to make it. So if they can make some things cheaper, like a lot of this rustic stuff we're buying, it's coming from India. India, they were not. We go to India and buy that out of all this restored lumber stuff, you know, nice stuff coming out of India. So if they can make it, then they should let them make it. That helps their standard of living, makes the products cheaper for us, and, and that's what free trade does. The second paragraph, this logic has spurned a steady decline in trade barriers since World War II. Since the 1960s, the average world tariff has declined from close to 15% to under 7% now. In the U.S., Japan, and the European Union, tariffs average below 3%. This has generated a corresponding surge in transport trade 
has dramatically raised the standard of living of people around the world. Around the world. So I'm, I'm a free trader. I believe in free trade. So. Okay, this, this is a kind of a, a story from my music store to uh, thing on the TV. Uh, this here is the, some of the companies we give. Do we give the hundreds and hundreds of charities every year? And there's this quotes from famous people. It's, it's kind of fun. Famous people and Jake Dad. Not so famous people. Famous people and not so famous people. So, last on the bottom, the bottom one, two, three, four, five, six, seven are mine. The last, the last seven are mine. Quotes there from a lot of famous people. From so these are handouts for you guys. Okay, uh, I got some few minutes for questions. Anybody got some questions? Always been, yeah. I actually went to Poland, uh, thinking you know it should be Jabskowski or something like that. But I went and looked and spent a whole week in Poland, going back, and it was always because it's German. It's a German name. It's not a Polish name. It's German. The opposite of German. Okay, anyway, if you speak German, if you speak German, Jab, it's Jabs. Jabs is Jabs in German. So I speak a little bit of German. So. Okay, yeah. Number one, don't be afraid to take risks. You have to be a risk taker. I've, I've taken a lot of risks. Just to show you, I, in 2013, I owned a store in the Glen, uh, Gilbert, Arizona. Uh, and I wanted to own with just social media. Now, this was a $30 million investment. So I owned with social media. We did $3 million the first month. I couldn't advertise. It was so successful. Today, that store does a hundred, over $100 million a year. Opened a second store in Arizona, doing over a hundred million dollars a year. There's a big risk in my age to spend this money. So be a risk taker. Don't be afraid to take risks. The second thing is, is have a passion. You gotta like what you're doing, you'll spend. This last week, believe it or not, I worked all seven days. Renee knows that. <laughs> uh, I feel guilty about that because we but we normally only I would normally at least take we take one day off. So I'm still working I'm still working 60, 70, I don't know how many hours I'm working. I don't keep track of it. But I like what I'm doing. I'm successful. I'm giving back. So uh, so that's the, the secret to it. So take risks and have a passion for what you do. Uh, don't be afraid to pay better. Uh, I always paid better. Our starting salary is $15 an hour. I'm going to, I'm cost, cost of raising that. If you had pay better, always stay with you. Jobs turn over. So don't be scared to pay good people. Number one, you got to buy it right. You got to buy it right. So you got to, and I did that from day one. I started traveling to Taiwan, Hong Kong, China, Singapore, wherever. You got to buy it right. So look at the buy. So many things are jobs. You know, of course, everything, most everything we buy is jobs to a third party distributor. We buy it direct from the factories and make the stuff. So we, you got it. Number one is you got to buy it right. And second, though, keep in mind, if you have the best prices, People come to you, and then they start recommending you. And that's what you need today. You need people recommending. Hey, I went to American Furniture. I got a great furniture. I got a great price. I shopped this store, and you have the best price. So by having the buying it right and having the best price, now all of a sudden, you start doing volume. Now your advertising costs, we spend 2.5% advertising, which that money goes to the bottom line. I bet the furniture row right now is spending at least 15% advertising. But I can take that difference and, and keep my good prices and 
do volume and don't have to spend. So have a business that, we, that people are recommending and send you people. And then that way number nine works. Have the best service. Have the best service. Have the best service. Yeah. Yeah. Service has become number one because of social media. Well, no, but social media is cheap and that. So you can have social media, you can have people saying good things about you on Facebook and Twitter and you know, all that stuff. And that's free. So if you have really good service, so today it's almost better than it used to be because social media, so much of that stuff is free. And that's what social media does for it. It'll say good things about you, it don't cost you nothing. So go ahead and keep charging less and giving good service when people say nice things about you on Facebook and Twitter and social media and Yelp and all that stuff, and you know, your business will flourish. Yes. You want to sell your product. We're looking, we're looking to produce. Sure. Okay. And the products are fairly unique. Uh, so the question then becomes, how do you price your product that you're producing? And how do you produce it at the lowest possible cost? Okay. Now, I think that they have to be able to have a little bit of a What you need to do is shop. I still shop, Renee and I, we still shop, I still shop stores. I do it. Because I do it for two reasons. One, I go in to make sure that they got something maybe that I can sell, you know, that looks good, or product good, or looks good to me. But then I have the best price. So shop, said the product you have, make sure that it's competitive in the marketplace. You see what I mean? That you have the, and then figure a way at how to produce it for less. Once you do that, and Amazon is not the reason. Thing is, Amazon, people are misinformed about putting it on Amazon. Key employees uh, invented a bunch of toys, and then he had it made in China, bought a full container. We helped him, we helped him get it in the train and all that. Put it on Amazon, that will be big. Because Amazon was adding their percentage and their freight and stuff like that. If he had taken that and went to the gift shops with it, it was a good product, he went to the gift shop, had the gift shop. There must be, how many gift shops is there in Colorado right now? 300 of them probably. Yeah. Went to the gift shops and got going and had these gift shops out to build up a market. And then when he was doing volume, then he could have went to a market like San Francisco or Dallas. I don't know what's going on. And so it's, so it's, a, it's a stair step. You know. But the way to get your product on the market is expose it to the consumer. Uh, who, who's your consumer? I mean, well, if you've got to have a product, number one, the consumer wants. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. You see what I mean? But the stair step to me is, if I was going to invent something, as I, let's say this product, this thing, this figure speaking, I would take it to Mike's camera, to the different camera shops, or people selling this stuff, and say, I had invented this thing. And they say, well, that's pretty cool, you know, go get it. Then I would find out how to make it, make it, and then that would be my start, and I'd get some volume. And from there, I could take it to the bigger dealers, and if I wanted to go eventually nationally, I would go to the electronic show, uh, the neon show in Chicago where they sell all this stuff. You see what I mean? It's a stair step still. And I didn't, I mean, I started out with a little guitar studio teaching guitar. <laughs> you see what I mean? But figure out how to get a product that'll sell and then merchandise it through the retail channels that make sense that once it's your product.
got you got to you got to keep reinventing yourself. That's the title of my speech today: reinventing yourself. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. By the way, I've always made some of my biggest that started American, where I bought American for eighty thousand dollars. Big recession, seventy three, seventy four. Some of you guys remember that? That was probably the worst recession. Well, the eighties might have been worse, but in, you know, there's been that was a huge recession. That's when I made the best deal. I made it through that eighties recession again. I went, went to nice store. So recessions, a lot of times, is opportunities too. It is. Did, did you have a question before you le left? Church, to, you know, it's very successful to give 10%. Uh, I've never done that uh, that way. I've just looked at the charity, found a need. This Project Cure, by the way, I was speaking to the op the, uh, not the op uh, no, Project Cure. I was speaking to the charity. Uh, I'm not the Optimist Club, but uh, you know, I speak to some of these uh, charities. That and they came up to me after and said, we have this thing where uh, we pick up uh, the unused parts. The you know, hospitals use gloves and then they never wear them again. And have a wheelchair. If somebody sits in it, they, they can't reuse it again, that type of thing. And so this project here picks up this stuff and sends it to third world countries. You know what? To make a long story short, uh, I, was, they, I said, it sounded like a deal to me, but they kept moving their products from warehouse to warehouse. You know, I challenged this charity, you can give them a million dollars, I'll match it. So we came out with two million dollars and built a warehouse for Project Cure. We call it the Dick Dab Warehouse for the World. Great charity, they send these products all over the world, but now they're in eight major cities. They're sending these, uh, uh, all the parts that hospitals throw away, sending them to third world countries, helping these countries save a lot of lives. The point I'm making, you find a charity that you know is doing good, it. And I don't count. That million dollars I gave them, I never said this is 10% or 2% or whatever it was. I gave them a million dollars because they needed it. And that's what I recommend. Doing things that, that do good. I think that comes from growing up poor, you know, I was born, the lots of grass is right in the middle of the Crow Indian Reservation. If you want to see poverty, go to Crow Indian. You can go today to Hardin, Montana, and you'll see Indians drunk on the street at 10 o'clock in the morning, and you'll see a lot of poverty in the Crow Indian Reservation. So I think growing up poor and seeing a lot of poverty, we had a neighbor that died of epilepsy. You don't die of epilepsy. So another in the neighbor that had polio. I saw a lot of, and we had, we had every disease. We had the measles, the mumps, the chicken pox, you name it. Because we were 70 miles from Milan, so there were no doctors, so we stayed home from school. But anyway, uh, the point I'm making, I think if you see a lot of poverty, it, it, you think if I could help poverty, and that's what we try to do. 
And I think it comes up from growing for uh, for seeing a lot of fossils, uh, where I can do that. And, uh, it isn't part of the requirement. I'm not saying that you need to be that way, but uh, I think if you can, it makes you feel good, and you can help people. Like now, see, the age facility was handicapped people. It used to be handicapped people were pretty much locked up in the room. And now they're out and going to school and graduating from college and, and doing all kinds of things. I help that a lot. Okay. Uh, so many of you have ever leased any of the land facility and already all the equipment that's been there? Yeah. Well, leased to, in fact, one building. Our store on that thing. But I've always, I own, otherwise, I own, I own all the buildings except one. I own all the trucks. Cash, yeah. money in the banks, land, yeah. land too. I've, I've made almost as much money in land deals and buildings as I have in the furniture business. Yeah. Yeah, I've sold, yeah. I bought land and I bought out the old homestead house buildings for 30 cents on the dollar and sold them, tripled my money on them. You've got to have yeah. patience. Because of the Arizona stores, and if any of you familiar with Arizona, normally when the when the snowbirds leave, the business in Arizona tanks in the summer. Our stores in the summer are really because they're 160,000 square foot showrooms. They're air conditioned. People can them to the malls. In our furniture today, which is the editor, the editor demanding that I meet him in Arizona to write a story. So successful in Arizona because people come in over the store that you can come in and buy from, where salesmen don't follow you around. And, and of course, that's a model all along. We don't have that up system where sign salesmen to the customer. So they come in, they have a pleasant shopping experience, have great prices, just killer prices, and, and our business in the summer booms just like it does in the winter in Arizona. So I think that's the most successful. And I was, I don't know, it was. I think almost 80 years old when, when I opened those stores. But that, it, it's, it's nice to be really successful and become known maybe not from your success. Yeah. What would you say is your first Right now, right, right now we're, we're, we're change, completely changing our advertising. It used to be uh, Newspaper and TV, and that's both of those are going into town. So we're completely ready. The last 12 people I've hired in my back room have all been, I have a special person doing nothing but social media, uh, uh, Facebook, full performance on Facebook. We have over 350,000 Facebook fans. Just think about that. We have 350,000 Facebook fans. Just, we have a meeting every Monday. I meet all these people together. Today, I have a person doing just email, a full-time person do email. When I was doing the, in the emails, nobody would open them. Now I've got a specialty person doing emails, and she just told me, we sent over a million emails this year already at a 17% open rate. And that's because she knows how to get people to open their emails. But I have special... Huh? <laughs> by the way, a lot of these people aren't that cheap, by the way. Uh, but website, guys... Websites, everybody today is looking on a website. Even on your stuff, I'll bet you they're looking on websites. So become a website guru, but if you're expanding your business, one of the first people you should hire is a webmaster. 
and have a good website. If you've got a good website, people can buy it. Several people do it, just websites. Website. But these 12 people are doing just social media. We're on you name it. We're on YouTube, uh, Twitter. We're on all of those things. So some of that I don't even remember. You know, Hulu and a lot of these, these things that are the new stuff. And that's just going to, guys, that's just going to get better because it's huge business. Because young people today are just, you know, you know, you see young people all day. You know. Did you hear about this 18-year-old girl that made it on the top of Mount Everest? She was going like this. And <laughs> but as you know, I still do that today. I still think, when I get up in the morning, normally when you first wake up, there's a little period of time when you're waking up, you got time to think. Can you guys do that? Your mind seems to be clearer, you think. So I'm thinking, how can I improve my business so I can be better? And when I wake up in the morning, I'm thinking of that. And that works. Now, almost every day I'll come up, I still from the old school, I still this is my stuff for tomorrow. I have a pencil with an eraser on it. <laughs> This, this is old school. See, the young, young people do it now on their iPads, or, or, but I still, this stuff, you know. So, but I think of ways that I can, like I got a note here to make more. I, I, I've been, you know, I had some real people doing commercials. I'm doing it myself again. You find out, so I'm doing all the commercials myself again. So I made a note here. I need to write a couple new TV songs. So. Anyway, that's kind of thing. So, but uh, think of that, where you're always thinking of, how can I make my business better? A good time to do that is when you wake up in the morning, your mind is clear, how can I make my business? And don't be afraid to change and take risks, because it's a changing world today. There's more changes in the last two years than I've seen in the 42 years I've been in business. More changes in marketing, social media, and, and everything else. Okay, I told you what, I, it's not almost 9 o'clock. I was going to auction off these tigers. And, and the money would go to your treasury, to the importer's treasury. All right, somebody here, somebody $10, give me ten dollars. Half ten dollars over here, twenty. Half ten over here, twenty. Half ten over here, twenty. Over here, twenty. How about a fifteen? Half ten there would have been a fifteen. Somebody fifteen dollars and now twenty and now twenty. Half fifteen. See, we take turns and it's your turn. Twenty. 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 I have twenty. Twenty now. Twenty-five. Twenty. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll sell you one for twenty dollars. Ready? Okay. Would you like to buy the other one for $20? Yes. Okay. Now, the big white one. Do you, do you want to hold the white one up? Yeah. Now, everybody should have one of those. What do you think? Huh? Okay, somebody give me a starting. Give me $100. Say, look at me, somebody be $100. Give me $100. Somebody, where are you starting? It's about a 50. How about you give me $50? Somebody be $50. Fifty dollars. Somebody somebody. How about twenty-five? Twenty-five dollars. Somebody did twenty-five. Twenty-five dollars. No. No tiger lovers here today. Twenty-five dollars. Okay. Well, if they worth that much. Too, much, too much. <laughs> I was just. I was just trying to contribute to your. To, to By the way, it's been fun, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.